Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and why do we give a month for Christmas but only one day for Easter when it's the most important day? We don't confess the fact that Jesus was born into this earth, but we confess the fact that God raised him from the dead. Have you been raised from the dead? Let's find out today on today's broadcast. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. It's great to have you here today. We have been in quite a lengthy study on the subject of resurrection. We're going verse by verse through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I believe it's a very important time that we study resurrection because the resurrection we are looking forward to is the resurrection of the church coming up very soon. Those who are born again will be taken up to heaven with Jesus. Here's how it's gonna happen. Jesus is gonna come back from heaven with a shout. I remember when I was in Bible school, someone asked our teacher, what's the what's, what's left until the rapture comes? What sign is there? He said, all that's left is the shout. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What's gonna happen is all those people of the church age that are in heaven, the family of God that's in heaven, they do not have a body, they are there in spirit form. We have a body here on earth, but they're gonna come back with Jesus on that day. He's gonna stop in the clouds and stay there. They're gonna keep on coming down and they're going to receive a resurrection body. Their old bodies are gonna be turned back into a resurrection body. This dust and ashes that their bodies turned into will become a resurrection body. Then we, on the other hand, will not go by way of death. We will just suddenly be instantaneously changed. Our natural body will become a resurrection body, then together we will all rise back, meet Jesus in the sky, and go back to heaven with him for seven years. During that seven years, we will have a resurrection body in heaven. Until that time, Jesus is the only one in heaven with a resurrection body, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But we will all go there, and Jesus will conduct during those seven years on earth, in so those seven years in heaven, he will conduct the judgment seat of Christ, of which our works will be judged. We won't be judged. We, will, we were judged whenever we received Jesus as Savior, but our works will be judged. We're told in Revelation 14, 13, that when we die, our works do follow us. So all those things we have done for the Lord will be taken to heaven, whether good works or bad works. We might have done things out of carnality, out of wrong motives, and those things will be judged, and they're called in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, wood, hay, and stubble. But the things we did for the Lord, with the right attitude, in fellowship with the Lord. No sin in our life, no, I mean, everything we did was out of a perfect motive toward God and people. That's called gold, silver, and precious stones, and all of our works there will be piled up together and tried by fire. The fire will descend on it, and guess what happens to wood, hay, and stubble? Poof, it's all burned up. We'll be rewarded for what's left over. And what's left over determines how we will rule with Jesus in heaven. Oh, listen, going to heaven is not uh, something that we have to work for. It's not a reward, it's a gift. So going to heaven is a gift, but we will receive rewards when we get there to where none of us will shine in heaven the same. It, and we'll find in this passage of scripture later, some will shine like the sun, some will shine like the moon, some will shine like the different stars. No two people will be exactly the same because no two stars or planets shine exactly the same. That is what eternity will look like. All that's determined by the judgment seat of Christ. Then we will come back with the Lord with resurrection bodies as a bride adorned for her husband, Revelation chapter 19. So we're looking forward to that. That's what's next on God's uh, uh, resurrection calendar. Then after that, at the end of the uh, tribulation, we'll enter in the millennial reign of Jesus with those on the earth who received Jesus during the tribulation. So there's a lot of good things to come, but all I'm saying is all this is, to, is good news to us. This is done for the call in the New Testament, the great hope of the church. The hope of the church is Jesus coming back and us receiving a resurrection body. But in the meantime, what we have today is a lot of people around telling, well, there is no rapture. There is no coming of Jesus for that. We're going to all go through the tribulation, all these things. And Paul warned the Corinthians of this in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and this is where we left off last time. Notice what he said, be not deceived, evil companions corrupt good morals. The Corinthians have been listening to the wrong crowd instead of those that teach the word of God. They've been listening to the Pharisees. They've been listening to false teachers who disagree with Paul and disagree with the word of God and often build it on, I had a vision. The Lord speaks to me. I prophesy this. But listen, prophecy 
is wonderful if it lines up with the word of God. If it contradicts the word of God, throw it out. If there's anything that's the one standard we judge everything by, it's the word of God. And Paul lets them know who you hang around is very important. If evil friends can corrupt your morals, then good friends can raise your morals and bring you blessing. That's why he said in verse 34, to these carnal Christians. The Corinthians had to be the most carnal congregation of all. And most of 1 Corinthians is just straightening them out. And then 2 Corinthians is finally beginning to get some instruction in them now that they have awakened. Now that they've come back to their senses, 2 Corinthians is what to do after the dust settles. And the dust was flying in 1 Corinthians. Verse 34 says, now awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So like the prodigal son who had to come to himself, then he now says, wake up like he did, and to the life of righteousness. And this is brought out in Ephesians 5, 14. Wake up, you who sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. So he's simply saying in Ephesians 5, 14, a carnal Christian is not spiritually dead. There's those that teach if you sin, you've lost your salvation. It doesn't say you're dead. It says a carnal Christian is sleeping among dead people. Again, I brought up the analogy yesterday, if you weren't here, and that is the fact if you have a hundred people here that are all uh, seemingly all dead, but one of them is just asleep. 99 are dead. One of them is asleep. You couldn't tell by looking at it. Why? Because a sleeping person looks like a dead person. That's why death in the word of God for a believer is often called sleeping because it looks, you look like everybody else that's dead, but you are simply asleep and a sleeping person does have a time they're going to wake up and the sleeping in Christ right now will wake up at the rapture of the church. So he's simply saying here that if you want to find out who's alive, you have to go check them closely. Are they breathing? You know, is their chest going up and down a little? Feel for a pulse. Put your finger under their nose and you feel any, any breath coming out of them. That's how you tell they're alive. So it is with a carnal Christian. You have to look for life because they always like to sleep among dead people. They hang around those people because they're no longer comfortable being around Christians. Why? Because they're always feeling uncomfortable and they're always feeling like that, you know, convicted for what they've done. Well, that's fine. Watch, that's what the word of God is supposed to do for a carnal Christian. But now he says, beginning in verse 35, we're going and talk about what is a resurrection body? Because the question then comes from them, well, well, what's a resurrection body like? We've always thought it was evil. We as Corinthians have been taught that the body is evil, the soul is perfect and beautiful, and death is simply you're being separated from this terrible thing and the constraints and confines of your human body. And so when we die, we cross the, the river Styx, we go to the Elysian fields, and we float there forever and forever. And so now Paul is answering the question, which they've all come now. Okay, Paul, if you're right, then what's a resurrection body going to be like? We've heard it there that bo dead that bodies are bad. He says, oh, no, no, not this one. Let me explain to you. God doesn't give you something bad. He gives you something good. Verse 35 says this, but some man will say, and of course, that's the Corinthians. All right, now we understand what you're saying, Paul, but we're not sure about this. What kind of body will we have? So he says, some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what kind of body do they come? Is it an evil body? He goes, oh, no, no. Like so many other passages in 1 Corinthians, Paul's not going to answer the question the believers have been asking, but they've been asking the wrong people. It's time to ask the right people. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 says this, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, Paul is answering throughout the book of Corinthians questions that they've been asking him, that they've been asking since he left them earlier, they've been asking this of, of the wrong crowd, of the religious crowd, and they've been getting wrong answers. And so Paul now says, come on, you've asked me because I'm going to do nothing but quote to you the word of God. I'm going to tell you God's viewpoint, not human viewpoint. So Paul will now go into a discussion of the resurrection body that we will all receive and then help us to understand the theology behind our new body. Let's talk about the resurrection body of Jesus. We're going to find out in this passage of Scripture, as it's described in other passages of Scripture, and that is we're going to have a body just like the resurrection body of Jesus. He becomes our model. He's the prototype. If you want to know what your resurrection body is like, go back and study his resurrection body. And much is talked about in those 40 days when Jesus rose from the dead and before he went into heaven off the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1. And so what, what was it described at as that time? Well, 
the resurrection body is a rebirth of your previous body. Now, Jesus had a body that did not have a curse in it, but yet it was still a human body from here on earth. It was the product of God and a woman. So his body that he had in this earth was sure, pure enough, uh, as pure as it was, but it was still yet a human body. Jesus received a divine body when he was raised from the dead, different than the body he had while he walked on the earth. Now, the body he had while he walked on the earth was born outside of the curse of Adam. Through the virgin birth, that 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 uh, seed of Adam did not pass into him. And Jesus prophesied in Genesis chapter three of the coming of the Messiah that he would be born of the seed of the woman. And of course, we know that was Mary. So the resurrection body was a rebirth of his previous body, which ours will be too. Only we carry the nature of the flesh with us called sin, but that sin will be is removed when we die. But the resurrection body that we'll have will not have the nature of sin in it. And we will have a body just like Jesus Christ. Jesus could appear and disappear at will at any time. And he would do that. He was suddenly here and suddenly he just wasn't there. The body of Jesus could walk through walls and other solid objects. He was just suddenly outside the room and suddenly he was just standing in the room with the disciples. Some people say, well, he might've disappeared here and reappeared there. He might have, but also he could walk through walls and solid objects. He could travel through outer space and he did on his way up to heaven. He could eat and drink, but he didn't have to. Why? Because a resurrection body doesn't need any food to keep it alive, but it can eat and drink. He could breathe, but he didn't have to. He even breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It was a solid body that he had, but it could be touched. Look at verse 36. You fool, that which you sow is not made alive except it first dies. Paul called them fools, not because they were stupid, because they were ignorant and they had to be taught. So all of the word of God simply revolves around this simple process of sowing and reaping. Mark chapter four, verses 13 and 14. And here, what happened was, is that uh, Jesus told them, do you understand this parable of sowing and reaping? A seed is thrown on a piece of ground. He said, if you don't understand this, then how will you understand all parables? He said, the sower sows the word. What am I saying? Almost every doctrine in the word of God revolves around sowing and reaping. God is good. And that's what can be taught from sowing and reaping. When you sow goodness, you'll reap goodness and God always sows good. And here toward us as Christians, especially, next of all, that parable told us that Satan is evil. God is good and he's a giver. Satan is evil, he's a thief. God is good because he gives. Satan steals what God has given and the hearing ear is the key to that parable. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear or it says in continuous action there uh, that he who has ears to hear, let him keep on hearing. That's what the whole thing is. Here's what Paul is coming back to. You wanna understand the resurrection? Look at the word of God and keep on hearing it, keep on hearing it, keep on hearing it. I'll see you right after we come back from the break. This is halftime and there's an offer for you on the subject of resurrection. When a Christian has passed away, we do not bury them. We plant them for a future harvest. One day, all Christians will put on a resurrection body. Our resurrection bodies will carry the image of Jesus. We will have bodies that will possess everlasting life. In this exciting six-part series, Pastor Bob Yandian provides a detailed study of the future resurrection of every born-again believer. Messages include a foundation doctrine. What if there is no resurrection? What is baptism for the dead? Sowing, reaping, and resurrection our incorruptible body, and the exception generation. To order Resurrection, go to bobyandian.com. A new book just came in. I've been waiting on this book, Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. Go to my website, bobtheandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, 
this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. In the first half, we talked about the resurrection body, and this is what we left off with. The resurrection body can be compared to sowing and reaping, and we ended with verse 36. Verse 36 says, you fool, that which you sow is not made alive except it first dies. So Paul called them fools, again, not because they were stupid, because they were ignorant, didn't understand what was being taught. In Mark chapter four, Jesus made a reference to because the first parable he gave had to do with sowing and reaping and had to do with there was a sower who took seed and scattered it on four different types of ground. And those four different types of ground were all believers. Now there's another parable where Jesus is the sower and that has to do with the subject of the gospel. And it says in that particular one in, in Matthew chapter 13 that the seed was the gospel. In this one, it is not. The seed is the word, and the one who sows it is the minister. And that could be you witnessing to people, or it could be you teaching a group of people, or a pastor teaching a congregation. And uh, basically, that particular parable teaches this, is that God is good and Satan is evil. God gives, Satan steals. Satan cannot create anything when he steals. He can only steal what God has given. So God is the original giver, the creator of all things. Satan is evil and he comes to steal. But the way he comes to steal is by getting your ear away from the word of God. That's why the key phrase in that parable is, he that hath ears to hear, let him keep on hearing. It's present linear action in the Greek. So not only is it, is it here, but keep on hearing, keep on hearing, keep on hearing. They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. So there's that continuing in it. And the hearing ear, again, is the key to that parable. So God who gives is not the key, nor is Satan who steals the key to this parable. The seed, the word, those things never changes. The word always works. But the ground, the heart of the believer is the key. The one thing that's changeable in that parable is the ground, your heart. You open up your heart and God continues to pour good seed. You close your heart, start listening to people around you and Satan can steal what's been sown in your heart. So again, what it comes back to that, that here Paul is talking about is quit hanging around bad people, those who don't believe the word of God, those that don't believe in resurrection and quit listening to them. Verse 37 goes on to say, and that which you sow or that which you plant, you do not plant the body that will be, but bear grain. It may be of wheat or of some other grain, but God gives it a body as it pleased him and to every seed his own body. We're gonna begin this section right here in this particular part of the broadcast with this, that sowing and reaping represents the resurrection and that your body is really the seed and it's actually the shell of the seed. Inside of your shell that you have right here is the heart of the seed, and that's your spirit and your soul on the inside, the inward man. And it says here that with every seed, God puts a body around it and that body is what eventually has to die. And in dying, that part of it does die. And this is what relieves life on the inside. When I was young, my mother used to uh, plant gardens in the back and she had flowers and she had vegetables and things like that. But what happened was this, she would order f through the mail and she would get these little little uh, little envelopes of seeds and they had a picture on the outside. It might be a chrysanthemum or it might be you know a squash or something like that. Why do you put a, a picture on the outside of it? Because if you open it up, all the seeds look pretty much alike. I mean, there may be a little bit of difference between the sizes of them, but they all look like all seeds look like seeds. But you don't know what's in that seed because what's in that seed is under the shell of the seed. The heart of the seed is a chrysanthemum and is a squash and is might be something else. And my mother used to be very, very careful. In fact, she would plant such squash in a certain place and then she'd put a stick up there and put that envelope on there so you could tell what was coming up there to be a picture of squash. So she'd know in this section is gonna be squash and wherever she planted chrysanthemums, it'd have a chrysanthemum there until they finally came up and you could tell what they were. Then she could take away those things things. So it is with our resurrection body. God has placed us inside of a shell. This body is the shell. When you plant a seed, the heart doesn't die. The shell dies the outside of it. And so the covering of it dies to release what's on the inside. That chrysanthemum comes from the heart of the seed. 
And that squash comes from the heart of the seed. But this outside has to die first. So it is with us. When we are placed into the ground and we die, the spirit doesn't die. No, the flesh dies on the outside, releasing what's on the inside to go to heaven. But one day, Whenever that plant comes up, the squash came from the inside of that. You understand that? The heart of the, of the squash seed produced the squash. But back in the house my wife and I used to live in, we had uh, trees all around the house, and what we had was gigantic oak trees. Well, they drop acorns all through the time of, the, I mean, the fall came and acorns were dropping everywhere. We would walk on them, they'd crunch under our feet and all this. I mean, we had, the, these things were hundreds of feet tall, and they just, and they, they covered our property. And so we'd walk on all those things. You know what? When that acorn is planted, that acorn's shell does not produce the oak tree. The oak tree came from the heart of that acorn. Now, an acorn seed, although the uh, that tree that grows out of it, that oak tree is almost indestructible. One of the hardest woods is oak. And it's hard, I mean, it's a hard tree just to cut down in itself because it's so hard. But it came from a very fragile thing called a seed. And that seed, the reason why it's fragile is the covering around it. We could step on it and we hear it crunch under our feet. Well, that thing was no good. The shell was now broken on the outside. But what I'm saying is this, is that once that dies, what comes up, that tree came out of the heart of the seed and the the the, the outside of it, the uh, shell around it began to die. And what came out, what was indestructible was what was in the heart of it. You and I have a natural body around us. It is fragile. It's subject to disease. It's subject to sickness. It's subject to the curses of this life down here. That's why we have to trust in Jesus, trust in the Lord, trust in those things to keep us in health, to keep us walking right. We're subject to the temptations of life. We need to walk in the word. Uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous. God will deliver us out of them all, but we have to follow him in doing so because we're surrounded by a natural body. This is what Paul has been teaching here. We have to have another body that will look like and, and protect and will be surround us as we will be a spirit being because the spirit is what itself is what comes out of us. In other words, the resurrection body doesn't come from this shell. It comes from the heart on the inside. Our resurrection body, since we are a spirit and the spirit is what's on the inside. We are wall to wall spirit, top to bottom, fingertip to fingertip. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live inside of a body and the body is the shell. But when we put a person in the ground, what happens is that shell dies. But the heart on the inside, the real inward man, your resurrection body comes from your spirit. It's spirit made tangible. And that's what happens again when that tree comes up. It is the heart of the seed coming up and turns into an, and turns into an oak tree. This is what our resurrection body is going to be like. Our resurrection body will be indestructible, but the body we now have is very fragile. And so this will be buried in the ground or one day it will be instantly transformed into a resurrection body if we are part of those who are alive and remain. And so this is what the Lord is saying. I simply come back to this. You know what? We don't, we don't bury Christians, we plant them because there's gonna come a resurrection day. What's this whole thing revolving around? Sowing and reaping. Genesis chapter eight, as long as the earth remains, there will always be seed time and harvest. And you can understand so many things from that. The area of God prospering and blessing us back comes by sowing and reaping. And here we have in this particular story, we have the story here of a resurrection, but we also have the Christian walk. What is it? The seed of the word of God is sown inside of us. We take it into the soil of our heart and all of a sudden out of that seed comes life. And we grow in all types of areas. We grow in righteousness. We grow in justification. We grow in our relationships with people. People. We grow in our relationships with God because these are the seeds that were sown inside of us. And the shell, again, releases what's inside of it. The seed, every promise of the word of God is a seed. And in it is so much wonderful stuff, but we have to take it in first of all. So verse 39 goes on to say, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fish, another of birds, you know what this verse is saying? There's no such thing as evolution. There's walls between the species. Fish do not produce birds and birds don't eventually produce people and fish don't produce people and the fish don't produce animals which eventually produce people. No, there's walls between them. Notice what the verse says again, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of animals, another kind of flesh of fish and another kind of birds. So there is no evolution. Man's flesh is different than any flesh 
of animals or fish or birds. Verse 40 goes on to say there's also celestial bodies. That's, that's bodies in the sky. We see them at night. That's, 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 uh, the, that's the stars and planets and all those out there, bodies terrestrial, that's on the ground. But the glory of the celestial, that's the brilliance and the brightness of the celestial is one, but the brightness of the terrestrial is another. And he's simply saying there's all kinds of categories here on this earth and the highest ranking on earth is people. People God made in his own image, in his own likeness. We can possess eternal life. We can walk in God. We are eternal. No animal is eternal. No bird is eternal. No dogs are eternal. No animals, no fish, no nothing is eternal. Just human beings. There's also spiritual bodies and natural bodies. Men differ in brilliance, in glory, brilliance of position, even on authority on earth. We have kings, we have governors, we have business leaders, we have school teachers, we have truck drivers, we have cashiers, all the way from those that we see represent some kind of leadership in government or whatever, that's kings and governors. But we also see it in the business world where we have presidents of corporations. Then we see in the school, we have inside the school, you have principals right on down to superintendents. And guess what? We have school teachers after that. But then we go down to truck drivers, cashiers that we don't see much leadership at all. But you know what? That's the way we all are. Different levels of position. So it is in the resurrection of the church and the resurrection of believers. The glory of heaven is different too. We have the Father, who's the highest ranking, the Son, who's next of all, and then after that, the Holy Spirit. Of angels, the highest ranking angels are the cherubs. After that are the seraphim. After that, we have the rank and file angels here that occupy the earth. So it goes on to say in verse 41, there is one glory or brilliance of the sun, there's another glory or brilliance of the moon, another glory or brilliance of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. The natural glory is as different on this earth among leadership, like even in government or business or whatever, as the sun, the moon, the stars, all are different in brilliance. But the spiritual kingdom is also as different as the sun, the moon, and the stars. In heaven, our brilliance will be determined by our rewards or literally rewarded by rewards. Every believer will be as different in heaven as stars from bright to dim. So is the resurrection of the dead, verse 42. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Ah, sowing and reaping. It is planted in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. And like I said, we don't bury Christians, we plant them because why resurrection day is going to come. So again, much of the word of God is understood by sowing and reaping. All I'm simply telling you is this, we're looking forward to the great resurrection day. Ah, but it's gonna be the day when the church now becomes the bride of Christ. And listen, inside of us is that inside of our seed. But what's also inside of us is also one other thing, and that is different levels of rewards here in life and in eternity. We'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.